Hello and welcome to Macros with Maitri, the ET Now show that takes a hard look at all the major macroeconomic issues and developments in India and overseas. Well, in the Indian macroeconomic firmament, nothing really gets bigger than the union budget. So with the budget less than a fortnight away, we're going to discuss, well, what else? The budget. And try and understand what is it about the Indian budget that gets it the kind of visibility it does, quite unlike most other countries where budgets scarcely arouse any interest. Is it because budgets in India are more about politics and economics? And if it is the former, does the country pay a price? I'm joined by three experts, Rajiv Kumar, Senior Fellow, Centre for Policy Research, New Delhi, Mahendra Dev, Director, IGIDR, Indira Gandhi Institute for Development Research, Mumbai, and T.T. Ram Mohan, I am Ahmedabad. Welcome to the show, all three of you. Well, I'm going to start by asking each of you in turn, how would you like to describe our budgets, our budgets in general, as political statements or as outlining the economic policy of the government of the day? Yes, I know no budget is entirely one or the other. But if you were to choose, which way would we were? What do you think shapes the budget more, economics or politics? Let me start with you, Rajiv. Uh, Maithili, I think uh, given that we are a federal democracy and that we do get uh, changes in our governments and therefore an economic philosophies from time to time, the budget is a very good opportunity to spell out uh, the political economy, the, the understanding of the political economy of the country by the ruling party. Uh, and I think that's the framework which the budget can provide. And also the budget can also provide a much, and does sometimes provide a you know, better underst analytical understanding of the medium term prospects of the country. Because there is no other document. Uh, there used to be a five year plan, but you know, th that was uh, done in a different manner. But the budget's medium term strategy uh, provides that analytical framework as to how the continuity in policy would be maintained as we go forward. Because I think th those are the two key things for the investor towards which the budget must necessarily be uh, targeted. One, uh, what is the understanding of the government of the political economy and therefore from that follows the policy that it would take. And two, how does the government look at the medium term prospects of the economy in which the investor also should make his decisions about, you know, about investment and capacity expansion, etc. So there, yes, budget is a political statement and a very important one. Okay, now let me ask Mahendra. Mahendra, would you agree with Rajiv that essentially the budget is the government's view of the political economy and it gives a medium term framework of the government also. Would you agree with that? Because I would have thought the government's election manifesto also gives you some idea of the government's view of the political economy. So do budgets do something more than that? And do election manifestos, are they only worth the paper they're written on? What's your view, Mahendra? Yeah, I mean, budget, uh, uh, you know, it will have both the political and uh, economic uh, uh, things but uh, but which you know, is more uh, politics is more or economics is more i mean i would say politics is more uh, but uh, depending on the situation for example now uh, we need uh, uh, more stimulus and that kind of things i think uh, economics is more uh, but politics is more nearing the election i mean for example the fourth year or uh, you know third uh, third year or fourth year but now i think uh, economics can be more uh, given the situation, the global situation and uh, the domestic situation. TTR, uh, I think Rajiv has one view that they're definitely more about the political economy. Mahendra Singh's, it varies. Sometimes it is more economic, sometimes it is more politics. And it varies depending on the situation. Which way would you like to swing? Well, I would say that uh, budgets in general are overwhelmingly uh, political documents. I mean, at a very basic level, budgets are about raising uh, revenues for the government and also deciding how to spend those revenues. So how to uh, raise revenues, whether through tax or non-tax means, whom to tax, how much to tax, and how to allocate the expenditure on various heads. I think these are essentially uh, questions of political economy. So politics will always dominate to a very large extent. But you know, at a, uh, at a slightly higher level, budgets are about managing aggregate demand, as we all know, the budget is one of two instruments for managing aggregate demand, the other being monetary policy. And this raises very fundamental questions about what you should do about aggregate demand. Should you increase aggregate demand? Should you keep it at the same level? Should you re reduce aggregate demand? And that in turn hinges upon what sort of growth rate you're looking at. Do you want to accelerate the growth rate or not? 
and what sort of risk to stability that you are willing to take in the process. And I think this question has been thrown into very sharp relief by the RBI governor recently when he said that it may not be worthwhile trying to even aspire for a higher growth rate because of the risk that would pose to macroeconomic stability. But that's essentially a call that the politicians must take whether the trade-off is worthwhile or not. So I think more than perhaps in previous years, in today's stressed environment, I would say that the budget is overwhelmingly a political statement. Okay. So I think the majority view here seems to be that the budget is more of political statements. But Rajiv, over the years, especially after the 1991 reform, have budgets become more economic statements? And increasingly are we seeing that if it is a political statement, it is the PMO's office that is really framing the budget more. And in that case, does economics always take a back seat and it is politics that comes to the forefront? Economic reforms and the agenda for economic reforms is at the end of it, a political, uh, you know, is, 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 is driven by politics of the, of the government in power. And it is the economic reforms that are very often encapsulated or projected in the budget. Therefore, spelling those out while they are in economics, uh, you know, they are, they are all about economics, they do reflect the political understanding of the, of the government. Give you an example, which is that if last year the government uh, announced the Jandhan scheme, you know, and, and they announced the whole scheme for financial inclusion, including the, you know, all the insurance policy schemes, etc. Now, that's a, that's a major step forward in economic terms, but it also reflects the government's political viewpoint of in emphasizing the financial inclusion and of bringing in all those people who are otherwise in the informal sector into the formal sector and make them beneficiaries of the formal financial and credit processes. So, yes, they are about economics, but given that economics is not just a technical question of balancing your books and are getting some equations right, but economics of a country, the development paradigm of a country is, is really the political economy of the country, the budget cannot but be a statement in political economy. And I hope that remains like so, like that, rather than become more and more technical and therefore out of sync with either the ground realities or the common sense approach uh, which the people will understand and appreciate. Absolutely, yes, it is true that budgets tend to be increasingly about poli the politics of the state of affairs. But Mahendra, budgets are also supposed to be about taxing and spending. But over the years, we've seen more than 70% of the FM's budget speech is devoted to announcing a virtual alphabet soup of schemes, almost reads like an election manifesto. So if the Congress-led governments named every scheme over some member of the Nehru Gandhi family, we have BJP-led governments either renaming these schemes or starting some variant and then naming it after some other leaders. The net result is that the meat of the budget, the taxation and spending, is really relegated to the fag end of the budget speech. Is that the measure of the relative dominance of politics over economics? Yeah, that is true. The first part of the budget, generally, you know, any government, uh, UPA government or the NDA government, they uh, talk about the schemes. Uh, and uh, the, only the next part, uh, part two, talks about the taxation and uh, uh, other I mean, expenditures. So basically, uh, you know, politics dominates uh, in the most part of it uh, because they want to show their ideology. Uh, for example, uh, you know, the, the schemes, uh, MG Narega initially, India government was not in favor, but now they are thinking of uh, reviving it and they are saying that you know, we should create more assets and all. So they want to keep the schemes uh, uh, because to show that they are more pro-poor uh, than, than earlier governments. Or uh, So I think you are right that uh, it is more uh, political statements, uh, most part of the budget, uh, but only the, uh, some part of it is on taxes and uh, expenditures. So TTR, let me toss the same question to you. If the budget is all about politics and there are so many schemes that the FM announces, many of these schemes are outside his remit. So what can the FM really do? Can he deliver on these promises? So what is the point of using the budget as a medium to announce all these various schemes? Well, the fact that it's a political document doesn't mean that it's devoid of uh, economic content. It only means that the economic direction will be primarily dictated by the requirements or perceptions of the political authority. So in the present context, for instance, one of the key questions is whether we need to accelerate the growth rate using a combination of fiscal and monetary stimuli, or should we stay where we are in the interest of macroeconomic stability, which is the point the RBI governor made recently. 
So I think this is a call that the political authority has to take in the present situation. And, um, you know, given the, given the promises on which uh, this government uh, rode to power, you know, the promise of higher growth and job creation, you know, I should imagine it would be very difficult for them to simply, uh, you know, press the pause button on growth. I think they will have to uh, think of some way to accelerate uh, growth and the, you know, the fiscal policies will have to be tailored accordingly. So I think, so I think we need to be very clear that just because the political authority is taking a call on the matter, it doesn't mean that there is no economic content. If anything, the economic content could be richer than what the prescriptions of economists might lead to. Okay. In fact, I would put it, uh, to put it very sharply, I would say that the budget is too important to be left to economists. Okay. <laughs> okay. Spoken like an economist, right, TTR? Well, I'm afraid it's time for us to slip into a very short break, but please do stay with us. We'll be back very soon. Welcome back. You're watching Macros with Maithili and we're trying to discuss the budget and Indian budgets in general. What is it about them that gives them so much visibility? And is it economics or is it politics that really shapes these budgets? Raji, before the break, we were talking about how the FM announces such a huge number of schemes in the budget. But many of these schemes are beyond the FM's remit. So what is the point of announcing these schemes in the budget? Can one hold the FM responsible? Or is it really the government as a whole? In which case, what is the point? Is the budget the right medium in which to announce these schemes at all? Yeah, so Maitri, I think that's a fair point that why should all the schemes be, uh, you know, uh, be announced in the budget and maybe the other ministries can do it uh, you know, themselves individually before or after the budget. But, you know, the budget becomes, a, as I said earlier, a kind of a statement of the collective viewpoint of the government, you know, the, of the cabinet's viewpoint. And also because the finance ministry is in some sense the guardian of the government's uh, expenditure and government's, you know, uh, pu you know of, of public expenditure and public revenues. And they are the ones who sort of, uh, who sit, you know, who decide what sort of allocations are made to different ministries. I think that's the background for the tradition of announcing various schemes in the budget because with each scheme is, uh, you know, with each, with each scheme, there is a particular allocation, a budgetary allocation that goes with it. And therefore, I think that's where that happens. It would be better, it would be better if uh, one could, uh, you know, do a more analytical budget whereby, you know, you see, you know, which, is, which are outcome-based budgeting, whereby, you know, the finance minister announces you know, what he has achieved, what the bang for the buck that he is spending, and, and also whether, you know, there are some schemes which have been discontinued or not. Because if you notice, no budget has ever told you that there are certain schemes which have, you know, which have just been, uh, you know, discontinued and they are being replaced by others. They keep adding on the schemes. So, yes, you have got a point that you, the budget could be more rationalized. But at the same time, uh, being the a document of the cabinet which reflects collective responsibility, I think it is, it's, it's useful to focus the entire, uh, you know, the, you know the, focus attention on the working of the government as a whole rather than do it piecemeal. Mahinder, Raji mentioned the reason why, you know, that there is a certain logic to announcing so many schemes because ultimately allocations have to be made. But if you look at it, the 1991 budget is often mentioned as path-breaking. But I, many of the reform measures that are attributed to the 1991 budget were actually announced before the budget or after the budget. So why is it that the 1991 budget is often mentioned as something that is really epochal? Uh, because the uh, 1991 budget, uh, you know, the reforms... Uh, started uh, so uh, people expected uh, changes in in our policies and uh, the they have uh, put all the you know the industrial policy the trade policy all these things they wanted to uh, change so as a result uh, also the private investment uh, has increased but uh, the public investment and those things they want to uh, have some statement on the reforms so the Dr. Manmohan Singh budget is uh, that way. It's a, uh, an important one in, in that uh, context uh, because of, you're right. The off budget, there are many uh, things can can be done, but uh, it is but it is all related to the uh, the funding. So I think so budget uh, should make a statement about the policies and uh, schemes 
and uh, apart from taxes and uh, expenditures. Uh, Rajiv, if one accepts that budgets are more political than economical, then are pre-budget election, pre-budget election, sorry, pre-election budgets, do they tend to be more political if you look at the 2008 budget of the Congress party, for instance, whether then FM, P. Chudambaram announced a huge fiscal stimulus that perhaps laid the seeds for the subsequent increase in the fiscal deficit and the ultimate slowdown. That just because it happened just before an election, it tended to be much more populist. So are pre-election budgets much more populous necessarily? Unfortunately, they have been so far. And, uh, and I'm, I'm really hoping that this particular tendency, this particular trend will come to a halt as soon as possible. Because as you said yourself, that one particular budget which increased public expenditure by a whopping 3.5% of GDP, even before there was any crisis like the Lehman crisis, etc. I mean, we, you know, we paid the cost of that in the subsequent years because of that, of that profligacy and of that, you know, of that fiscal profligacy and ramping up, you know, consumption demand uh, without, which caused then the double digit inflation uh, afterwards. So you know, I, I think that pre-election pre budgets should not be populist. And if they are populist, they should be populist only to the extent that they will, you know, they would announce schemes which the government might take if they were re-elected rather than push money out of the door and, and, and in some sense bribe the electorate because then that same electorate uh, gets punished because of what the government has done. So it's really a short term money illusion which comes to a knot because of what then unfolds afterwards uh, because of that one mistake and or because of that real weakness that that pre-election budget has shown. So I'm hoping that the government will stick to good economics because I am the firm belief that the good economics can also be good politics as we go along. But I do hope you're right and good economics is also good politics. But Mahindra, if I were to ask you, can you name some of the budgets that you think that were really you know, worth remembering? And along with that, some of them that are best forgotten. Mahindra? Um, in the 1996, Chidambaram's budget is uh, supposed to be a, a landmark uh, because of uh, tax reforms and other uh, things. I mean, 1991, of course, is a path-breaking one, uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh's. And uh, so, 91, 96... And uh, some, uh, uh, of course, uh, you know, during the last years of UPA, uh, you know, the, uh, so not much happened last, uh, you know, two years of UPA. So that way, some are uh, quite good and uh, some, uh, yeah, as, you, as you mentioned, that uh, we have to forget because nothing, nothing uh, happened in that budget. But let me ask you one last question, TTR. You know, does the public really ever hold FMs or the government accountable for where they, whatever they announce in the budget? Because governments make so many grandiose announcements. And by the time the next budget rolled by, everybody's forgotten about the previous announcement. So what is the budget really about? Because if you're going to announce various things, you're not going to be answerable for any of that. Then what use is the budget? Well, you know, there is accountability because I think the degree of scrutiny of the budget is unbelievable in the Indian context. I mean, I doubt that there are many economies in the world where the budget document is, uh, you know, analyzed uh, so carefully and, you know, minutely as in India. And uh, there may not be accountability in the sense that, you know, some immediately there are implications for the government. But I think everybody understands uh, whether budgetary promises have been fulfilled or not. And uh, there are, uh, you know, perceptions which are shaped accordingly. So there's certainly consequences for the government, you know, if they should renege on their commitments or fail to live up to their election promises and so on. So it's not that, you know, the government stands to uh, lose office if it doesn't deliver on particular budgets. But I doubt that the cumulative outcome of these perceptions can be ignored by any government. In fact, if you look at the kind of energy that goes into budget formulation and the sort of interactions which the finance minister has, uh, the sort of assurance which is even the prime minister gives in relation to budgetary matters ahead of the budget, I would say that the government takes the budget uh, very seriously, but that does not mean that they are guided entirely by the perceptions of uh, or the prescriptions of economists. So they have their own views on these matters. But it's not my impression at all that governments can afford to take the budget very lightly or take the assurances in the budget very lightly because I think there are consequences. 
Well, I'm afraid we've really run out of time, so we'll have to end this discussion. Thank you so much, Rajiv, Mahindra, and TTR for joining me in the discussion. Thank you also for watching. Clearly, budgets in India are a bit like the great Indian wedding. A lot of sound and fury with atmospherics often overriding the content. But at the end of it all, nothing really much changes. So we'll have to wait this time for the 29th of February to see if this year's budget is any different. And then maybe you can call and tell us what you think. Remember, we'll be back next week with yet another edition of Macros with Maithili. Till then, it's thank you and goodbye from all of us at ET Now. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash ET Now and don't forget to click the like button. You can also follow us on Twitter at ET Now Live. To stay updated with all our programming, hit the subscribe button on our YouTube channel by logging on to youtube.com slash user slash ET Now.